Okay, hello and welcome back, everyone. This is Ben Chiriboga, the Chief Growth Officer here at Nexel, coming to you with another fireside chat. I am very, very excited to be speaking today to our new friend, Peter Connor. Peter, welcome to the Nexel Fireside Chats. Yeah, hi, Ben. Thanks. Um, it's terrific uh, to be here with you, especially given the uh, Australian connection that we both mm, have. Absolutely. I, um, I, uh, I have fond memories of Australia. Long story short, you know, I was there right before the COVID pandemic and it was, um, it was, it was an interesting time to be. It was my first time in Australia. It's such a beautiful country so far away from New York, from where I went. Mm -hmm. And, um, and my time there was just really looked back uh, fondly. That was the first time I went there, and it was under under interesting uh, circumstances. I will have to tell you, and maybe uh, some listeners—I can't even remember—but some listeners know that I uh, uh, how I left uh, how I left in that in that pandemic. It was probably uh, the, the the worst flight of my life. But we'll put that aside because my time there was fantastic. Landing back in New York City terrible but nevertheless um it's fantastic to uh, to have gotten the chance to go there and sydney's beautiful so you are you are based in uh sydney, i'm based in correct? sydney yep that's yeah. right <clears throat> wonderful so why don't we start a little bit with talking about maybe your background and leading all the way up to uh the consulting practice um alternative legal some of the offerings really just to ground it but today for all the listeners, breaking the fourth wall, hi there, listeners. We're going to be talking a little bit about kind of the change imperative, and Peter is going to give us a insight into, for law firms specifically, how how uh, in-house teams um, are really thinking about change, some of the struggles, some some places where law firms can lend a hand. But let's start with your background. You have a very long background in legal, of course, uh, starting all the way with Micro Sun Systems, if I'm not, and then Citrix. And well, you'll tell yeah, us all yeah. about it. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Ben. So even before that, I, I worked with a law firm, Baker McKenzie, one of the the world's mm -hmm. largest law firms yeah. um, here in Sydney, and also up in Hong Kong. Um, and then I after about eight years or so working in Baker's, I went in-house um, with Sun Microsystems, which is now part of um, Oracle. Um, so I worked uh, as an in-house lawyer in the tech industry for probably 25 years. Um, I, lived in, I lived in Silicon Valley for a while, which was uh, a terrific time, um, during the earthquake, actually, the uh, San Francisco earthquake. But anyway, that's, a, that's another story. Um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I had some time there. Then I also went over to England. Um, I was European General Counsel, back to Australia. And then for my last gig in, in law was uh, General Counsel for Europe for Citrix Systems, a uh, software company based out of the East Coast of the US. So yeah, a lot of experience as a lawyer. But then when I wanted to come back to Australia about 10 years ago, um, I decided I wanted to do something a little bit different. And what my passion is really working with people and uh, trying to get them to reimagine the work they can do and um, their capabilities, if you like, to do new work. Um, and I call that human transformation. There's a lot of focus at the moment on digital transformation, rightly so, but what seems to be overlooked at the moment is really human transformation. And that's the, that's the area I focus on. Um, so yeah, I've been doing, um, for the last eight years, Nine years, I've um, you know, developed a range of programs that I have rolled out to, uh, and I usually deliver in workshops. Uh, these are either training or, or, um, con or consulting or more recently coaching. Um, so I do the combination of those three things. And I really, I guess I describe myself as a guide. Um, I try on, you know, lawyers individually, legal departments and firms are on a journey in what are really quite challenging times, as you said. So um, I try and apply the experience, the global experiences that I've had to guide them in, in a different direction, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, one that I feel is going to give them a better chance of success and fulfillment, and more importantly, prepare them for the future. Um, so that's kind of, and that's all around the T-shaped 
lawyer idea, which we'll get into a little bit later. Yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Yep. Amazing. What's um, what's what's a lawyer like you uh, so interested in human transportation? I mean, human that's transportation, true. human yeah. transformation. Yeah, you know, lawyers are they're supposed to be highly analytical. Um, if you listen to uh, my friend Dr. Richard um, from Lawyer mm, Brain, no, who you might yeah. record, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, lawyers are almost asocial in some in some capacity. <laughs> and of course, you know, we're, we're talking about averages, right? To the lawyer out there, I'm sure you're very personable and all the rest of it. But but um, um, yeah, tell us about uh, tell yeah. us about human transport human transformation That's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. Um, I sort of stumbled upon it. I was lucky to work in with companies like Sun and Citrix. It gave me a lot of scope to work in my own way, I suppose. And so I stumbled across this, this idea of essentially this idea of being a business person, not just a lawyer um, and doing business work and doing business advice, not just legal advice. That's my new vision in, in a nutshell. Um, and I stumbled across that. Um, by almost by accident, um, and um, there wasn't any guidance out there to kind of help people do that. Um, and I just found that super interesting. And, and the the point, the, the story that really highlights this, and I mention it in the book um, that I've written, a new vision for corporate lawyers, is um, when I won the um, CEO, some Microsystems CEO Business Leadership Award. There were there 24,000 employees. I was one of six employees to win this award, the only lawyer. And, you know, and we got interviewed by all the business executives, including Scott McNeely, the CEO at the end. And one thing that became very apparent, cutting a very long story short, is that, first of all, they, they thought I was quite unusual as a lawyer. But what they were looking for was more than just great legal advice. And what they liked about what I was doing was going out of my lane and kind of helping the business in ways that they didn't expect a lawyer to do. Uh, and so that in a nutshell was, a, was an awakening for me that, wow, this is powerful. It's helped me to be successful and have a really terrific you know, life and enjoy my, 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 league, my life as a lawyer. And yet so few people do that. There are a few that do it, but they don't spell it out. Or they don't call it out and they don't spell it out. And that's what I've done in the book and that's what I do in my work. So yep. it's really focused on getting into, you know, the very simple things of what work do lawyers do and what new people like to talk about soft skills, but it's a lot more than that, as we'll explain in a minute. But it's about, you know, those sort of things and getting into that stuff. And I just yes. love it. And I just love helping people to be yes. to realize their full potential. Absolutely. I um uh, I want to I want to notch something because you and I uh, share sort of a passion. It seems like for storytelling, you you pointed at the famous hero's journey, right? It's uh, everybody goes through their own hero's journey and using the guide, and that's 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 a lot of the human human transformation story in some sense. I just wanted to call that. Out. I don't know if you're you you've used that, and of course you've written the book. Lots of lots of authors know, of course, the hero with a thousand faces and Joseph Campbell and hero stories and all of that. Was I picking up on something there? Do you know? You were, all of you us? Were. Yeah, good thing. Sure. exactly. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so why don't we go into the substance here? Um, T shape, T shape lawyers, um, a concept that maybe anybody who's uh, gone into business sort of understands. Why don't you summarize it a little bit for us, and then maybe piece it together with the idea, your major thesis, I would say here, um, right. in terms of something more beyond legal advice. Sure, Ben. Uh, thanks. So uh, about nine years ago, um, there's a lawyer in the States, Amani Smathers and I, independently and around about the same time, sort of came, you know, sort of applied the idea of the T-shaped professional to the law. Um, and, you know, the T-shaped professional, if people are not familiar with it, is the idea that most professionals, whether they're accountants, IT specialists, human resource people, whatever, have a, a very I-shaped in other words, they've got a very deep expertise in one area, um, but frankly, pretty limited capabilities and experience beyond that. And whilst that might have been okay in the past when people worked in silos, increasingly that's not okay. As you know, teams need to collaborate. You know, um, so firms need to collaborate with clients and within organisations, you need to collaborate with other people, not just sort of work in your own little office on stuff. You know, the, the idea of just being an expert, a narrow expert, frankly, 
um, doesn't kind of work as well. Um, and so this idea of um, developing, not to the same extent as your core domain expertise, but to a limited extent, some experience and capabilities beyond that um, is, is what's really you know, very powerful and makes you more effective in, in this changing world. Um, and so I came up with the, um, I applied the idea um, of the T-shaped lawyer. And most people who have heard of the T-shaped lawyer probably think of it as just developing a range of non-legal skills, so-called soft skills. But in fact, um, that's almost a secondary question. The question of what skills you need really depends on the first question, which is what work are you trying to, to do? And the assumption most people make is it's just legal work. But frankly, you don't learn non-legal skills to do legal work. I mean, you can, and it does help to some extent. You learn non-legal skills and other things to do non-legal work. Right. And in a, and in a com corporate law context, whether that's a law firm or in-house legal department, that non-legal work is business work. Right. It's basically about doing business, do business, not just law. So hence, what I tried to, to tease out and, and, and to be very precise and clear about is the idea that a T-shaped lawyer is someone who is a form of legal expert, business generalist. That's another idea from the business world, the expert generalist idea. Oh, so it's a version of that. But it's specifically, it's a business person, not just a lawyer, who provides business advice and input to their clients, not just legal advice, and who does business work, not just legal work. So that's in a nutshell, now, and I explain what all that means <clears throat> in the book. It's, it was a lot of detail there around what, what, what are examples of all those sorts of things. And obviously the way that applies is a little bit different for someone working in a law firm versus someone working in-house. In fact, even within those two big buckets, there's a lot of variation. There are people who specialize a little bit more in some areas, but even then, I give an example in the book of, let's say, someone who's a, a patent lawyer, and that's a pretty narrow area of specialization. And yet, um, my colleagues at, at Citrix who were working in, with patents, they didn't just apply for patents. They kind of realized that there was a problem in that every invention in the company, people were saying, you know, let's, go, let's patent this, let's patent that. There was no process for figuring out how to to decide who should be, which invention should be patented. So they came up with the process. They got a team together, a steering committee together, and then came up with some evaluation process. So that's an example of business work. That's not legal work. That's right. business work. And it's very, very valuable legal work. So why do you do all this? Why is this important? For lots of reasons, uh, which goes to the change imperative we can talk about in a minute. But the fundamental reason is to add more value so that you can be more valued by your clients. That's in a nutshell, the ultimate, I call it the ultimate change objective. Yeah. Okay, so let's go into, cause I'm actually very curious about the idea of the change uh, imperative. Um, am I, you, you said imperative, right? Imperative, uh, the change exactly. imperative. Okay, so imperative is a very, a very loaded word. It, it, seems mm. to, it seems to suggest cannot not be done. Right. Yeah. It's not it's not really uh, it's not Watching. really up up for up for an option. Exactly. Mm. So this is interesting because because many people push back and say, well, that's OK, but I also just want to be a lawyer. I, I heard something in there and the way that you phrased it, your phraseology was very interesting, which was um, it was it was around the fact that uh, and this is what I picked up on siloed work is kind of not even doable anymore in, in the capacity that work tends to be almost, almost have to be delivered in some sort of process, process flow per se, effectively. And that, and that no professional can really sit in their office anymore and just hand over a paper into the void and not really like worry about it. That's just one little thing that I had heard that I, you know, was an interesting perspective shift from me, but why don't you talk about why this is imperative? Um, in 2023. Right. I'll come back to that point in a minute, but just to answer your question more generally, I guess, yeah, on the surface, um, except I, I know in the US there are quite a few layoffs and stuff at the moment. So, you know, obviously some people are impacted by that. And, and that's actually a reason in itself um, to do this. But, but oh. 
generally speaking, lawyers around the world are actually doing all right. Part, you know, law firms, partners are making lots of money. You know, those working in-house, the number of in-house lawyers is increasing. You know, so you'd think on the surface, well, what's wrong? You know, why change? But you scratch the surface a little bit, as I do. I mean, I work with in my workshops with thousands of lawyers all over the world, in China and the States, Europe, you know, Australia, everywhere. And I literally, I spend days with them, you know, in workshops. And I can tell you for sure that, you know, the vast majority of lawyers, there's something that they're not, that, there are lots of different things that are under the surface that they're not fully satisfied. And, and, um, and I'm leaving aside mental wellness and you know, mental wow. health. I'm leaving that aside because that, that obviously is another dimension. But if we're just talking about, you know, success and fulfillment and performance, then the problem is that one of the big problems is that especially let's take in-house for a minute is that you know, lawyers do great work and, and yet their clients, the business colleagues don't really fully appreciate the work they do. You hear that time and time again and it's almost like, well, there's something wrong with the clients. They don't understand how good we are. But I say to them, well, hang on a minute. Maybe the work you're doing is not the most impactful. <laughs> And, and shouldn't the alarm bells be going off? So being valued is, is one thing. But also beyond that, it's things like adapting work. You know, we've got obviously a lot of focus now on chat GPT and generative AI and the fact that, that that is and will encroach on traditional legal work. So, you know, what are lawyers starting to adapt their work in, in the light of that change, that immediate change, not some future change? And the answer is mostly no, they're not not in any significant way. So there's no adaptation of the work that they're doing. And what about preparing for the future? You know, are they really preparing themselves for the future? I ask that question and more often than not, people are not, they're, they're, they've got no idea. And so they're, they're sticking to this. And by the way, being that narrow, you know, that if you think about it, having a narrow skill set doesn't actually prepare you very well. It doesn't um, allow you to be adaptable. Um, it doesn't, you know, enhance your value prop. It's a very limited value proposition. And you can extend that same concept to the legal department and to a law firm. So yeah, of course, there's still this need for kind of legal advice. And, and by the way, back to your point earlier, a lot of firms, a lot of lawyers still do work, you know, in silos uh -huh. on their own. Um, but, you know, what I think is going to help them to be more adaptable to, um, you know, to, to be more resilient, to add more value, to be more valued, um, and to realize their full potential. That's the other thing. A lot of lawyers feel like they're frustrated. They're just not, you know, experiencing the growth, the personal growth, the learning that they really want. So there's a lot of reasons there uh, underlying that are what I call the problem and the and are part of this change imperative. I have a whole chapter on that that I go into um, around in the book around um, the, the changing landscape and why, in summary, these... Um, so th they're sort of internal things we've been talking about just there, but there's external changes that I have a whole chapter on that, that explains that, you know, the world is changing big time, big time. And, it's, and, and COVID and I think ChatGPT are a wake-up call about some of those things. And it's not just the pace of change, which, of course, is accelerating dramatically, it's the nature of change. I talk about this discontinuous change, not just continuous change. In other words, the past right. is no longer right. really right. Uh, so helpful to, to think about what's going ha you know, to happen in the future. And that means you really need to reimagine things, uh, your work and, and what you're capable of doing. So that's, in a broad terms, you know, kind of what's happening and the dynamics behind what I call the change imperative and why not that you need to, but, but, but you may want to change. And these are reasons why lawyers, and that's the angle I take, you know, this is in your interest to change. <laughs> Not because you have to, because someone, because I'm telling you you have to, but um, that's the angle I take. And, and if you take that angle and you look at that reasoning in the book, most people are convinced and go, okay, I get it. Yeah. And, and most people do get it. Okay. I um. I think we have a good good grounding of the change in imperative. And uh, to your point, you know, you it, it, uh, you're raising a flag, and if you want to come over to the side of the boat, you know, there there's there's something there effectively. Um, uh, 
and, and while also laying out this is this is where this is how to to keep the boat metaphor this is where all of the uh, the chairs are on the deck right now of effectively and what what may be where the boat is is sort of like going so why don't we de- dive deeper into this idea of what does this look like and maybe as a bridge to that to the to the to the new paradigm that we are leaving um uh to switch back to a hero hero's journey metaphor you leave you leave and then you were in the Theoretically, yes. you return, but you're different, you know, effectively, if, if, you, right. if it's circular. But the new, the new world that we're getting to, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, I think we hear a lot about ideas like legal <clears throat> operations or mm. alternative legal service providers, yep. or you hear about, um, you hear about new products and services getting up. Uh, 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 push together. You hear about um, you hear about deal making and client experience and layering those things. Is this what we're sort of pointing at as we leave the old world and sort of travel through the desert, maybe to 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 our new uh, to our new paradigm and our new oasis? Are these yeah, the sort of absolutely. things that we're picking up? Absolutely, Ben. And um, I think the alternative legal service provider example um, is an example of of that. In that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, that's an example of what I would call realizing this vision of. So it's not just a vision for individuals, T-shaped lawyer. It's a it's a vision for legal departments and firms. Um, so I've got a T-shaped team framework and a T-shaped firm framework, <clears throat> and I help KPMG, for example, here in Australia, to essentially set up an alternative legal service provider business. So that's a, an example at a at a law firm level, at a business model level. So there's different levels at which you can apply this vision, this new direction. And you're absolutely right. You know, providing, because you think about an alternative legal service provider business, it's, it's a terrible name. It's so, in, it's so <laughs> incorrect because it's not alternative. Right. Right. It's not legal. The work that a, they do is really mostly, I mean, they do have some talent on demand. But other than that, most of the work they provide is business. Yeah. It's helping, it's business, you know, products and services for law firms and legal departments. Uh-huh. So, um, and that's an example. It's a great example of what I'm talking about that, you know, um, we, where law firms can provide not just legal support <clears throat> and legal advice, but business support for their clients. So a great example at a business model level. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an example, but I'm talking also then at an individual, you know, uh-huh. back to the humans again, sure. about what, what uh, lawyer so but sorry just to continue the thought so legal operations so if you think about that legal operations in a legal department is is one of the big changes for sure and their work is not legal work they're working on the business um and you think about a law firm they've got business development people they've got project managers they've got tech people you know non-legal professionals they're all doing business work <clears throat> so that's all well and good um but the problem with, and that's great, <clears throat> but I'm talking about something more than that uh-huh. because what those folks are doing is really focused on the business of the law firm, the business of the legal department. And uh-huh. the big, the, the extra jump that I'm talking about is really uh-huh. helping the business of the client, the business, the company. Sure. Sure. And, sure. and that's the thing that not many legal departments or law firms are doing. Yes. Um, and so that's the, the, extra, the extra jump. Now, I say <clears throat> that lawyers need to be aware of that. So a lot of lawyers are saying, you know, let's leave it to the legal ops folks. Let's leave it to these other <laughs> uh, legal professionals. Right. I'll right. just bunker down and focus on being the best lawyer I can ever be. Sure. I say <clears throat> that's not good enough anymore. I mean, that might have been okay. Might have got you to where you are today, but it won't get you to where you want to get to tomorrow. For that, yeah. you really need to understand back to the horizontal aspects of the T, um, you need to understand, you know, what it takes um, and, and provide. So I break it down into three examples of business stuff. So it's uh, business partnering, business leadership and business development. So business development is what you know everyone knows in law firms speak. Uh, that's, you know, uh, and that's mainly for law firms, obviously. Um, but lawyers there should know about business development, should participate in that. That's what's going to help you get promoted to a partner and be successful. So clearly there's value in that. 
business partnering is sort of in, in the middle. And that's very simply uh, bu- giving business advice and business input. Um, and anyone, whether you're a law firm lawyer or you're an in-house lawyer, you can do that. And you can do it in conjunction with the work you currently do. It doesn't have to take any extra time, except, except instead of just focusing on the legal stuff, if you see a business issue or problem, and you know when you're advising on something, you, you speak up and, and you raise that issue. And some people do that naturally, some don't. Um, so that's what I mean. It's back to that idea of calling it out and spelling it out. And then there's business leadership, which is mainly for in-house lawyers, but that's the idea I gave you earlier of the patent thing, you know, where um, you go above and beyond. That does take time. It's true business work. It's not just business advice and input. It's a lot more than that. And I explained that. And so that's a great opportunity to do business work if you're an in-house lawyer. So there's sort of three buckets of business work, all of which um, requires what I call a business person mindset. So I've come up with this idea of a business person mindset, and that's the idea of as opposed to just a lawyer. So I contrast the two, just like any mindset, growth mindsets or whatever. There's just a a lawyer mindset and there's Uh a business person. And in short, a business person, whether you work in a law firm or a legal department, thinks about not just the jobs they've got to do and, you know, their legal tasks, their contracts and things for the day, but they think about the business, the business of the firm, if you work on a firm, the business of the legal department, if you work in a legal department, and the business of the client, of the corporation. And so I, that's why how I won that award in a way. I was always thinking about the business. In fact, my business, the guy I work for, the VP of sales, said to me, Peter, I'd have you on my team, even if you weren't a lawyer, and even if I had to pay for you, pay your salary, I was paid for by the legal But And that's probably the ultimate compliment you can get paid. And that's the what some people like to call the trusted advisor, yeah. which, of course, is something a lot of lawyers want to be. Yes. You don't be a trusted advisor just by giving great legal advice. Sure. I mean, you be, you're a trusted advisor if you're someone your client will go to because they just want to bounce things off, off you and get your input. And that's the sweet spot that every lawyer wants to get to. And the way to get there is to be a T-shaped lawyer, not an I-shaped lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, let's touch very quickly on trusted advisor. And then I, and then I have a, and then I have a, a pro- provocation for you that I'd like to like for you to answer. And then, and then let's, let's go ahead and wrap up. So, you know, the trusted lawyer, whenever I've always tried to, um, as somebody myself who practiced for, for years and then made the big jump and now, you know, running a technology company, it's, it's, I had to basically give myself a lobotomy to, to even do this. Um, I, um, to, to, to tell you the truth, um, T I O all the rest of it. I, I spelled a lot of it out. Um, mm. But I, but I wanted to get to the trusted advisor because while I was practicing, I did feel this this pull into the trusted advisor. And, you know, somebody, um, somebody, and I'm just going to put this on the table so that you can react yeah. to it. But, um, mm. you know, somebody explained to me you, in The Godfather, uh, Robert Duvall's character was uh, the consigliere to The Godfather, of course. Mm. And it just so happened that he also had legal skills such that whenever The Godfather had some problems or needed a contract done the legal expertise could sort of come in. But as consigliere, he was first interested in the business of, well, the family business as we all know it. So is that a, is that a good way to sort of flip, you know, the touch on it? I don't know if you've ever thought of it in that capacity. You can not. react very good. Yeah, right. I have not, but I love it. I love it. It's very good. And, and it is. That's it. See, yeah, there's the right. irony, Ben, that um, that's right. If you get to that position, which I sure. got to with my right. most of my um, senior uh, VPs that I work with is that not only if, and it's fun, it's more fun. Gee, I mean, it's much more fun to do that than <laughs> yeah, to, right, to be in that back office, just run, working on contracts in, in a silo right. on your own. So, but more than that, it gives you a chance to, to uh, realize your potential, to grow, to learn new things. That's how you learn about the business by being sure. in the business. So it's not working on the business, it's being in the business. Right. And um, yes, and you, and not, but you can also be a better lawyer because guess what? You get so to I hear think. about things like right from the outset, not at the last minute. Right. And so you have a chance to influence things. So people often say, oh, you know, you don't want to be too close to the business. And they, and they point to Enron and all these disasters. <laughs> and I say the fact that 
you know, one or two bad lawyers did, did the wrong thing does not mean that that idea is flawed. The idea is very sound. Um, and there are many, many lawyers. I'm not the only one, by the way, who, who, who work this way. But I think I'm the first one to call it out and spell it out. And that's what I'm trying to do you know, in my work. Um, yeah. and, and the second book, by the way, the T-shaped lawyer framework is the is I'm, I'm just finishing off now is really the it's all the combination of things you need, the how to be a lawyer. So it's skills, competencies, qualities, mindsets and knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, that's something I dive into yeah. there. That's what most people think of the T-shaped lawyer, but it's it's actually what you are and what you do. And then the second question is, what do you need in order to do that? Yes, um, totally. That's the right way to look at, at the yes. stuff. Totally. So we, we're going to end here with it's um, it, it, it's a good next step because and now let's go back to the hero's journey and the famous hero's journey. The first the first big obstacle for the hero is that he has to leave the place of security first. And that basically is the first big challenge. Now, sometimes that person is helped by a guide. OK, let's let's do something easy. Um, Luke Skywalker meets Han Solo and Han Solo helps him basically get over himself and the fact that he's just a little kid who lives on Tatooine and there's nothing important and he can't really do anything. They reframe. And I think that's what we've talked about. However, here's the, here's the provocative question, you know. That is sometimes the first hurdle to cross. The hardest thing is to break down our own senses of ourselves, limiting beliefs. If you want to go into mm. psychological and, and therapy mm. speak, you know, what, how do you, in the co course of coaching, you know, how do you start to help people expand the frame, give them a new perspective, but, and most importantly, this idea of you're, you're this now, but you could be this. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? You know, how to yeah. even, how do you even expand that idea of, well, this is what I am. This is who I am. I go from, I go from elite lawyer to average business person. If we put all the cards on the table, you know, because I, I haven't ever done that. And if I'm 45 years old or 50 years old, don't I lose all my leverage? I mean, to be very direct about it. Now, of course, that's okay. maybe not true, no, but but that's the that's the provocative question here. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's a very good. There's a lot of questions actually in sure. that, yeah. in what, but just to address a few of them. So you're right. Um, so the first thing I would say, there's two kind of general things I would say in answer in response to that. One is that it's back to the mindset thing, right? So this business person mindset. There's a great book called uh, The Adaptation Advantage. I don't know if you've come across that, but a great book. And um, they talk about how adapt the adaptability is one of the actually killer, killer qualities. And I totally agree. Um, but one of the problems with adapting, and this is, a, this is an adaptation, no doubt about it, to be a T-shaped lawyer, is identity um, gets in the way. And your identity is like a block. <clears throat> and for professionals, they actually refer to it. And lawyers, identity is a real big problem because guess what? You put all that time and investment and money into being a lawyer and God damn it, you're going to be a lawyer. Well, what I say to that is I'm not saying give up any of that. I just say you need to, you need to just tone that down a little and you, need to, you can also be, you're not losing anything, but you can add something by being a business person and adopting the business person mindset. So it's adding something to what you've already got. And that, all, that's, that same concept, that same analogy applies to the work that you do. I'm not saying suddenly, so it's actually not like, you know, uh, uh, the, the example you gave where you've got to <laughs> right. do something and completely right. disconnect, cut the umbilical right. cord. That's not what this is about. You keep, uh -huh. that's why I call it the legal expert business general. So it's, it's a T-shaped lawyer. Uh -huh. So you're still doing a lot of the stuff that you're doing, but you, although by the way, you got to get rid of a lot of stuff, obviously, you know, that, and that's part of the, the game. But no, this is about <clears throat> uh, inch, you know, inching your way in, using the skills and capabilities that you have. So a lot of the, I call them natural business partnering assets. Um, that is your, for example, the ability to analyze things properly, to think, you know, problem solve, to, um, you know, uh, and, and to communicate clearly. All of those things are assets every lawyer has, but they only use them at the moment in relation to, to legal advice. I say you can use those in relation to business work and business advice. 
And you could do it like like business partnering, that, that thing I was talking uh-huh. about. Every lawyer can do that just as part of the work they currently do today. You, this is no, no jumping into another thing. <laughs> this is just adding something to it. And, that, and you can slowly over time kind of do more of that, do it better. If you build up your capabilities using, for example, the framework, um, and then, and over time, as you as you get out of the work, so the idea is to get out of all that work that, frankly, your clients don't really appreciate, and really doesn't make a huge difference if you do it, and freeing up time to spend more time doing doing this and doing this business leadership and business development stuff. That's what the name of the game is, and that's exactly what I help you know, lawyers do individually, but also legal departments and firms. Yeah. So yeah, they don't have to make the big, the big jump, thankfully, uh, they can transition into it, but it's a mindset has to change. Yeah. It's crucial. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, I appreciate it. you don't have to leave Tatooine and, you know, get on a, get on a thing and go to another planet and all the rest no, of it. It is, it, it is a both and here, right? <laughs> it is, it is a both, it is a both and, and you can sort of build off. This is fantastic. So, um, why don't we, why don't we end Peter? Do you want to tie together the first book and the second book? I know you plug that and maybe talk a little bit more, uh, coming down tactically. So you, you offer some coaching, consulting, you do this on a team level, on a personal level. Yeah, put together the package a little bit for us. Yeah, thanks, Ben. So I guess, um, okay, so the first book that's out, um, uh-huh. it's free. You can ask, just find me on LinkedIn or um, and, and whatever, and I can uh, give you copies for free. It's called um, A New Vision for Corporate Lawyers. It's part one of the T-shaped lawyer series. So it's about, that book is about why change because I, I agree with you I mean you know you got to make the case for change and why people would want to change not just need to change so I devote a whole couple of chapters to that and then secondly that first book is about what <clears throat> what that change looks like to go from an I-shaped lawyer to a T-shaped lawyer a legal business um, legal expert business generalist um, and spell that out in some detail so that's the first book so the second book that I'm just finishing up now is called The T-Shaped Lawyer Framework. And it's a very comprehensive set of things you need to, skills, competencies, qualities, mindset, and knowledge that you need in order. It's the how, the how to be a T-shaped lawyer. You can use the framework actually just to be a lawyer. That's, and people do. So I've rolled this framework mm. out, for example, right. Right. a law firm in Asia with a thousand lawyers, 10 countries with... Over the last three years, we've rolled that out as part of the professional development programs for them. Because a lot of, I think everyone understands now that you legal skills and knowledge are no longer sufficient. Everyone gets that. But they really have no idea what other things you need. People are just picking random things like, you know, yeah, tech, right. for example. I mean, tech Sorry. is important, but it's not just Sorry. about tech, as Sorry. important as it is. Um, so there is a bunch. Of, and the reason I know these things is because I've, I've used them. I've stumbled across these things and learned them and learned how to use them and why they're important. So I put them all together. This is not based on a survey or anything. This is based on my own personal experience. And I've since sort of been using that in my programs and workshops. Um, So yeah, so the way I help um, law firms and legal teams is through either consulting, um, which I did with KPMG Australia, for example, as I mentioned, um, which I did with this firm in Asia to roll out this professional development framework using the T-shaped lawyer framework, or through training, you know, workshops that I do with corporate legal teams. I'll sit down with a you know group of 20, 24 people in wherever, any part of the world, and I'll take them through the step by step, you know, kind of the, the framework step by step on how they can change at a team level. And at an individual level, you need to do both. And one of the beauties of this vision that I'm proposing is you can do both. They are aligned. Um, so this is a way, if you like, <laughs> this is the way for the whole corporate legal industry to move in a completely different direction. One that I feel is going to be more successful, more fulfilling, and, and definitely more fit for the future. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I, I had a podcast earlier um, with Christine Lindbergh, who is the director of marketing and communications at Vishome, which is a, a, a large, a large law firm in, in Norway. And you know, I'm bringing this up just because I, I mentioned to her 
Um, similarly, she was talking about the need for internal training, upskilling, reskilling, um, and and then constant coaching to sort of like make these sort of th- things yeah. thick um, in that capacity. And I'll also mention it, and I'll just give it to you um, whenever I feel resonance with people. You know, I uh, I'm keen of this idea, this visual that we are in a time between worlds. We 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 believe, we think that we know where what we're leaving, where we're maybe even like a tribe. Um, that is that is leaving someplace, but w- maybe we're, it's not completely clear, and we haven't gotten to where we're going to go. And in the process, of course, there's a desert that we have to sort of cross in trials and tribulations, and we need help as as we sort of go together. But but doing it together is incredibly important. And you know, just to say that um, you know, always keeping yourself abreast. If we are in a time between worlds, it's really important that you stay abreast of all of these little pockets about what's happening because you know. We're leaving someplace, and but maybe we haven't gotten to to the other place. I um, and I just want to say, you know, work like yours. You know, it's um, uh, it, it's good guidance work as we're sort of coming coming together um, to sort of figure out what's what's kind of coming next. I don't know if that vision resonates a little with you, and if you have sort of a resonance similar that we're in a time between worlds in that way. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, in fact, um, I did a LinkedIn post the other day where I said, you know, wh- why don't people change? There's a an American psychologist, Dan Gilbert, I think is his name. Sure. Yeah. And you know, he quoted saying, um, because people are very familiar with the past, but they can't imagine sure, the, future. the future. Right. Or well, something yes. like that. That's not quite sure. the quote, but it's words to that effect. Uh, that's rather difficulty in imagining, you know, the future. Sure. Uh, that's that's sure. just too difficult to imagine for most people. So what I'm trying to do is imagine I have imagined a future, which wow. is a different what that future thing can look like and I think and that's one of the problems is that I don't think too many people have done that and if you can't paint that picture of the future then it's very difficult to get people to like you say leave to give up what they're doing and to do that so I believe that to be true that's why I take a I think a vision is so important and that's why I try to do in the book Um, and also then this is change management principles to be honest future state vision Compelling right. reasons to change. Yeah, that's right. So I'm totally. using those principles in order to make that case, you know, for change, for a specific yeah. change. Yeah, it's totally. Well, Peter, I think we're going to wrap up here. Thank you so much for taking time to walk us through. Of course, everybody, please go ahead and connect. Any final words? Any the, any words of encouragement? Any good places to start? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, a good place to start is to read the, that first right. book. It's, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, exactly. it's, it's, it's a heavy duty book. I get that. Um, and so I'm trying to break it down in my LinkedIn post. So connect with me on LinkedIn and you'll get little chunks. I've got a T-shaped lawyer YouTube channel as well, where I kind of do little short videos. So people want to get little snippets and they, cause I get it that people are busy and, and there's a lot in that book, um, to think about. But I suppose the other thing, yeah, final thought is look, I know everyone's busy, but this is important um, stuff for, for you, uh, for, for lawyers and for law firms out there. So you need to take the time to, you need to figure out what's important and what's not, and then th- take the time to understand what's important and to think about stuff. Like you say, Ben, it's, um, the game is changing and you need a game changing strategy and approach and vision. Yeah. Right, exactly. Thanks, Ben. Great job. No worries. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, And please reach out to Peter. Please connect with him on LinkedIn. I am connected. His content is great. I really have enjoyed it. Um, And if you like this fireside chat, please like, subscribe, whatever it is that you're on. You're probably watching it on YouTube or uh, maybe on the LinkedIn or something. But yes, thank you so much uh, to Peter. And we will be back very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ben.